All right, um, looks like we're live. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Um, this is the Biotechnology Breakout Session 2, and we will be uh, presenting the white paper that uh, we as a group, the Biotechnology Working Group, have put together. Um, just a quick reminder to please type your questions in the chat box, and we will be answering them at the end uh, as part of our panel discussion. Um, and please, uh, please use that chat box so that we can really drive some discussion during the session. So thank you to all of you for that. Um, I'd like to begin with a short um, Sanskrit phrase that I think is appropriate uh, to the current situation in India. Our prayers and thoughts go out to everybody in India who are uh, having insufferable losses as a result of this pandemic. Uh, the Sanskrit phrase goes like this. Swasti prajabhyaha paripalayantam nyayena margena Mahim Mahishaha, Go Brahmani Bhyaha, Shubhamastu, Nityam Loka Samasta Sukino Bhavantu. And this translates roughly to May there be well being to the people, may the leaders rule the earth along the right path, may animals and humans always be fortunate, may all the beings in all worlds become happy, peace, peace, peace to all everywhere in all circumstances. I think that could not sum up better what we are hoping for the people of India and our hearts go out to everybody who have uh, lost people in that country. Let us now begin with the session. Uh, Nikita, if you could take us to the next slide, please. So I will be your panel moderator. My name is Rohan Iyer. Um, my uh, expertise is in cell and gene therapy. And um, my topic uh, that I will be presenting as part of this white paper is on the area of novel cell and gene therapy approaches to combating COVID-19. Um, if we move on to the next slide, we can um, uh, be introduced to the rest of the panel here. Uh, so among our distinguished panel members, um, whom I'd like to introduce, um, we have uh, Dr. Grant Pierce. Um, he's a professor at the University of Manitoba, Winnipeg and St. Boniface Hospital. And he will, his topic area of expertise is the impact of COVID-19 on nutrition. Um, we have Dr. Venkat Venkataraman, or Venkata Ramanan, I should say, um, who is the Chief Scientific Officer at Macquarie Imaging. Um, his area of expertise is in UVC disinfection techniques. We have Ms. Valli Natarajan, um, who will be, uh, who is an intern at Orchid Pharma, and she will be uh, covering the topic of mask recommendations in her section of the white paper. And then we have, uh, last but not least, Ms. Nikita Thakkar, um, she is a uh, MSc candidate at the University of Toronto in translational medicine and sick kids hospital. And her topic area of expertise is coronavirus biology and vaccine landscape. Each of them has expertise in the areas noted below their names and has contributed materials significantly to this white paper. And we thank them for their contributions. Next slide, please. All right. so. Let's talk a little bit about the biology of coronavirus. Um, coronavirus is a group of related single-stranded RNA viruses that cause disease in mammals and birds. They typically cause respiratory tract infections that range in severity from mild to lethal and have existed in nature for quite some time. In fact, we've been studying their spread in humans since the 1960s. So it's been several decades of research that we've already had put into their, their spread. The spikes, on, on the protein coat are most the most distinguishing feature of the coronaviruses and are responsible uh, for the corona or halo-like surface um, that distinguishes these viruses from other viruses. The spike proteins are the targets of most vaccines currently. And as shown on the left, you can see sort of what that spike protein looks like on the virus uh, structure. On the right, the virus, we have a diagram that shows how the virus enters its host cells. It enters through binding of ACE2 receptors or angio angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptors, which are abundant in lung epithelial tissue, and proceeds to replicate by taking over the machinery of the host. The RNAs encode for the proteins required for RNA replication. And prior to exiting, the proteins are folded together to form a capsid containing a viral RNA and, and packaged. The virus then exits the cell and proceeds to infect other cells. There are many points during this replication cycle where you can block the virus and different vaccines block different parts of the entry replication process. Some small molecules and enzymes, for example, proteases are currently being developed to stop this. 
And we've also heard some evidence earlier in the meeting of how glucose analogs are also being used to uh, provide an alternate decoy energy source to stop this pathway in its tracks. Moving on to the next slide. Currently, there are several strains present globally, but the most prominent among them varies by region. So as shown in the table on the left, the most prevalent mutation in the UK continues to be the B117 variant, while in India, as many of us know, the B1617 variant is taking hold. Many of these mutants were only discovered in the last six months or so, underscoring the speed with which mutations have occurred. In particular, the key mutations of interest occur only in a few parts of the spike protein as shown in column three of the left table. And their effects include allowing immune checkpoint escape and also higher binding affinity. We don't know if these mutations are render the viruses more fatal. We just know that they're more infectious. The virus spreads faster than the original strain or also known as Wuhan uh, one. And on the right, the data from the CDC shows that we are increasingly seeing more strains uh, appearing on, on the, uh, across the globe. As shown from January 30th to April 10th, a proportion, the proportion of variants is spreading within the community. It is worth noting that the Bodith biotech vaccine known as Covaxin actually shows some efficacy against the Indian variant, which is causing most concern across the globe right now. Um, and I think it, it's, it's important to note that there are three prominent strains right now, as I mentioned, the B117, B1351, and P1, um, and also B1617, as I mentioned. Okay, so that is that slide. Let's move on to the next one. So in this table, we see that the various vaccines available have different characteristics and efficacy rates to different strains of the virus. Indeed, uh, some of them have different numbers of doses and timing between doses. So as an example, we all know that the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, for those of us who have received them, are have two doses. These are mRNA-based vaccines, and the timing between the doses is a minimum of three to four weeks apart, while the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is a single dose and is an adenoviral vector-based vaccine, which means it's based on DNA, not RNA. Their efficacy against various strains is also presented in the table. Note that we will be providing a much fuller treatment of this table in the white paper, but suffice it to say that there's a lot of data and an effort that went into making this, and it is too information heavy to cover here in this brief summary, but we can cover this in more detail once we publish our white paper. Next slide. So social distancing and mask recommendations. Um, many of us are aware of the need for social distancing and mask wearing. This has been a part and parcel of our lives for more than a year now for most of us. But there are now significant data to model and demonstrate that these, these measures indeed do work to reduce the spread of the virus. So as shown on the top left, social distancing on its own can reduce contact rate by 30, 38% and flattens the curve peak by 50%, while the addition of the mask adds an additional layer of protection. On the right, we see that some of the groups uh, are in fact more susceptible, but that wearing a mask helps to alleviate some of this burden. There are concerns with the need to adjust a mask while wearing and how this introduces more contact points between the hand and the face. However, the benefits still outweigh the disadvantages and it is highly recommended that people wear their masks appropriately. Next slide. So this again just shows the same data in, in greater detail um, as, a, as a heat map. Um, we don't need to go into this in too much detail, but um, this basically shows the same thing that I just talked about. Next slide, please. All right, so in terms of masks, um, there are different types of masks. Um, of course, we've all heard of the typical uh, medical masks that are, are common in hospitals and healthcare settings. Um, that's the one in the blue in the middle. Um, these are also called surgical masks. They're meant to protect the wearer from contact with droplets and sprays that may contain germs. And medical masks filter out large particles in the air when the wearer breathes in. On the top of that, we have a higher grade of mask, the N95, and this is actually more of a respirator. Um, it filters out both large and small particles when the wearer inhales, and healthcare providers must be trained and pass a fit test um, prior to using an N95 mask. Um, then the last type is the kind that may be more commonly used in the home or for routine tasks outside of the home, which are cloth masks on the bottom. Um, 
Uh, a cloth mask is intended to trap respiratory droplets that are released when the wearer talks, coughs, or sneezes. It also acts as a barrier to protect the wearer from inhaling droplets released by others. Um, and I think the key message at, at the end of all of this is that any mask is better than no mask. And medical masks or N95 masks should really only be prioritized for use by healthcare workers um, or people who are, work, are exposed to healthcare settings. And ultimately, any barrier that protects you that or those around you is going to be useful in suppressing this pandemic. Um, it's also worth mentioning that, you know, how you wear your mask is important. It should really cover your mouth and your nose. And so if you if you see somebody not wearing their mask properly, please call them out on it and let them know that they should be putting their mask on properly. Next slide, please. Um, so a little more on N95 respirator masks. Um, they are needed when there's a potential for aerosol transmission. These respirators are designed to fit tightly over the operator's face. And like I said, you know, if they're if they're not being used on your face, then they're not being used basically appropriately. So um, very important that that proper seal is maintained. Um, when there is a proper seal, the air the worker breathes passes through the uh, respirator's filter, which then captures those contaminants. Um, the advantages of the reusable respirators is that they're durable. They stand up to repeated cleaning and disinfection, um, maintain uh, their fitness over time, and their cost savings of reusing them. Um, but again, there are disadvantages as well to using reusable masks. And, you know, there are some contamination risks with reusing a mask. Uh, so it, depending on the application, um, a, a different type of mask may be appropriate for different applications. Next slide, please. Now moving on to uh, a slightly different topic, um, the impact of nutrition and, and how this has impacted our social behaviors um, and our nutritional habits during lockdown or quarantine. Um, what we know now is that, you know, during the pandemic, food consumption habits have changed. Um, the access to things like warm meals, uh, healthy fruits and vegetables um, has diminished, um, you know, and just in, as a consequence of the lockdown itself, not having access to warm meals or being uh, hesitant to go out and grab, um, you know, something that is uh, healthy and cook it. Um, versus something that's quicker and perhaps deemed to be safer has has changed how we behave. And so there has indeed been a decrease in the consumption of warm meals, vegetables, and fruits as a result of this. And there is evidence to prove that. Next slide, please. Conversely, there's also been an uptake in the consumption of unhealthy food. So we've seen increased consumption of things like sugary drinks, sweets, salty snacks, and this is primarily the result of the being in quarantine and lockdown. So in, in other words, we've been relying on more prepared or snack foods more often in the absence of a continuous supply of healthier foods. Next slide, please. So interestingly, food itself is not a very effective medium through which to pass the virus on to others. But the reality is that the surfaces or packaging that our foods are wrapped in may indeed be contaminated and sustain the growth of the virus for up to 72 hours. So as shown here, under lab conditions, the virus can live you know, between one and three days on plastic, stainless steel, and cardboard matrices. But there, like I said, there's no evidence of this transmission to date um, via food. Um, so that's, that's encouraging. But at the same time, you know, the, the fact that the virus can live on these surfaces does give us some pause and we should reflect on whether we should be, you know, doing, make, taking additional measures to avoid transmission via contact with that packaging, for example. Next slide, please. So general conclusions on nutrition are that better nutrition can have both an acute and a long-term positive effect on COVID-19 pandemic morbidity, growth and mortality. Um, but don't expect that nutrition to necessarily prevent infection. Um, really, all that is going to do is going to, it's going to increase your overall health and your ability to um, uh, maintain a healthy lifestyle, but it doesn't necessarily prevent infection. Um, and the second conclusion is that the COVID-19 pandemic has had significant effects on short-term nutritional behavior, mainly due to isolation and availability of healthy options. And this may have long-term effects on human growth and health, but only time will tell as to what will happen there. Um, Thank you. And uh, let's move on to the next slide here. All right, so the next topic here is cell and gene therapy and how this is being used to address the, the evolving pandemic. Next slide, please. 
So um, what we're seeing here is, um, firstly, what are cell therapies? Let's let's address that question. Uh, cell therapies are are basically living biological um, material that are that are almost like drug factories. So unlike conventional drugs, these tr drugs can be used in the body. They they act in a way that is similar to how cells in your own body act. And they can be used to treat everything from cancer to Parkinson's disease and, and many, many more other indications. Um, currently, there are 3,600 active and recruiting trials in cell therapy and gene therapy and um, on, on clinicaltrials.gov and these and numerous indications. So on the right here is an image uh, from a nature paper that demonstrates um, just how um, uh, cell therapy might be used to treat uh, COVID-19. An example of a cell therapy that is able to do this and that has already been in clinical trials is the mesenchymal stem cell. Many of you may be familiar with it. Um, and basically how it works is in our immune system, when we are in, infected with an invading cell or a bacteria or a virus, that virus is detected by uh, messengers in our blood known as T cells and other cells like neutrophils and macrophages and dendritic cells. And when this happens, they start to release pro-inflammatory cytokines, and this causes damage to the lung endothelium. And this is how actually acute respiratory distress begins, and it's one of the key symptoms of COVID-19 infection. So how we can use stem cells to, to alleviate this is that mesenchymal stem cells in particular are known to be immunomodulatory. So the yellow cells on the bottom left there are uh, known to suppress the T cell response. And by suppressing that T cell response, we then reduce the amount of inflammation that they cause in the lung epithelium. And this is how we're, we're currently looking at um, using cell therapies to treat this pandemic. Next slide, please. So this is a summary of the clinical trial landscape. Um, as you can see, there are about 81 active recruiting or enrolling uh, clinical trials by invitation. Um, and among these, about half of them are using mesenchymal stem cells, which I just alluded to earlier. Um, you know, these can come from Wharton's jelly, umbilical cord, bone marrow, and um, in some cases, placenta, adipose, and dental pulp. Um, we also have a, another high cohort of T cells that are being used. So immune cells, T cells, and NK cells that are also effective in, in treating these, these sorts of indications. And there are some non-cellular approaches, acellular approaches, such as exosomes and adenovirus-associated adeno-associated viruses that are being used in novel ways uh, to address the pandemic. Next slide, please. So some key considerations with cell and gene therapies are there are limitations. Um, the immunomodulatory immunomodul effects that are used in the case of mesenchymal stem cells they essentially suppress your immune system, which means that they actually kind of paradoxically can make you more susceptible to infection. Um, they do require more complex manufacturing than conventional drugs or biologics. Um, they need to be are preserved typically in liquid nitrogen vapor, and they are susceptible to raw material shortages and consumable shortages, um, which can affect their ability to be available to, to patients. However, on the advantages side, these are living factors, which means they continue to exert their biological effects in vivo over time. They can be engineered with features not present in typical innate cells or biologics, so kill switches, payload delivery, um, including monoclonal antibodies, receptor honing, and Boolean logic. And they harness, harness the same biology that causes the disease to eradicate it, which is a very interesting approach. Okay, so we can move to the next slide now and move on. All right, and then the last topic of our white paper is really um, the use of UVC to disinfect surfaces that may contain uh, the virus. Uh, so um, if we look at this image here, um, SARS-CoV-1 persists on common use surfaces for a few minutes to several days. Um, disinfection with chemical sprays or wiping is the most commonly adopted method. So the low initial cost, ease of use, et cetera, are the reasons why people typically go to chemical sprays or wiping. However, um, there are several health, environmental, and long-term cost issues associated with chemical disinfection. With UV in the 200 to 280 nanometer spectrum, classified as UVC or germicidal UVC, uh, it provides a viable alternative and it addresses all of the long-term use considerations. So if you look at the table on the left here, um, you can see that you know, indeed several surfaces um, you know, have different uh, amount, degrees of viability of the virus in them. So paper is not a very good surface to 
retain the viability of the virus, whereas um, you know other surfaces like plastic and stainless steel and fabrics can actually harbor the virus for a very long time. And you know UVC can address many of these uh, issues. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, as shown in the figure above, UVC works by penetrating the cell wall of a living cell, such as a bacteria or a virus, which then damages the nucleic acid strands and renders the virus unable to replicate. It is effective and also broad spectrum. It's eye safe, it has minimal long-term effects, and it has a low consumable cost. And it also avoids corrosive chemicals and manual labor. So uh, overall, it's a very good option and it's also environmentally safe. Moving on to the next slide. Um, the speed of inactivation is very important, right? We wanna be able to inactivate the virus as soon as possible and as quickly as possible. So as seen in the first uh, half here, uh, SARS-CoV-2 on paper and cardboard surfaces is active only for uh, 30 minutes as we saw earlier. However, in common use cases, it can be viable for infection. Uh, repeated cleaning of frequently used surfaces such as doorknobs, handrails, et cetera, is almost impossible in many situations. And so in those cases, chemical disinfection is not possible. You know, for example, shared cutlery in restaurant, electronic tools in, in a dentist office, many medical settings have these issues where, you know, people are constantly opening doors or, you know, handling patient um, tables or, or beds or whatever. And as seen in the, in the graphs above, um, UVC is very fast acting. It can be used in a variety of places and, and it's very effective. Moving on to the next slide. So while low pressure mercury lamps are the most common source of UVC, they are getting phased out due to environmental issues. And in the last couple of years, LED sources have become more increasingly efficient and cost effective. So LEDs can also be used um, in this situation and they can also be used in a variety of configurations. So um, for example, they can be integrated with other electronic controls built into the units that are already used in other situations. And so in conclusion, while chemical disinfection is currently popular, UVC provides a very good alternative uh, for specific use cases, and it helps to eliminate some of the long-term health and environmental impacts associated with disinfecting chemicals. Okay, so this, is, this was a, a very brief but overview of, of our white paper, and now we'd like to open up for the panel discussion. So I'd like to invite our panelists to, to turn their videos on and unmute their mics. Um, as we start to take in questions. Um, let's now look at the questions. Um, I'd just like to remind everybody that there is a chat box down below. Um, please feel free to use that chat box to, to ask some questions. And if we don't have any right away, I think maybe I will kick things off and hopefully that'll generate some discussion. So let's now start off with a question for Nikita. Um, Nikita, um, you know, you, you put together some of the material that we presented on the various vaccines available and variants, um, and there are new variants and, and new information constantly being uh, doled out on the news and in, you know, publications around the timing between doses of vaccines and kind of the efficacy of, of different variants uh, of the vaccine against these different variants. So how can our attendees sort of sort through all of that noise and, you know, sort of make sense of it, given how much is changing all the time, in your opinion? Yeah, I think that's a difficult, that's a question that I think even um, individuals that are actually in the scientific field may also um, have confusion with that there is a lot of information that is being put out constantly. I think the first thing is you definitely need to be looking at multiple sources and not just relying on one and really not def not believing just every headline or WhatsApp news um, that you receive, but really going to the sources and to uh, credible sources that can provide the information. I think the other thing to also note is that in, in theory, all of these vaccines should have some protectiveness against these uh, variants. How much, to what degree that is, is, may not be well known just because we haven't had time to do research with how quickly the field is changing. But that being said, as long as we are practicing the, uh, the social distancing and mass recommendations made by Ms. Wally, as well as taking our vaccines, we should be um, protecting ourselves to a certain degree towards this. And as for misinformation, just really um, be critical at the sources where you are getting your information from. Um, and I think that maybe perhaps answers the question. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm sure, yeah, I would imagine that it was difficult for you to actually get, you know, 
up-to-date information when you prepared some of that in, that material, right? You know, sure. it, it's and hard. It, yeah, go ahead. And, and, and to a certain degree, even from uh, individuals or from companies that have looked at efficacy, they're not necessarily revealing to what percentage or what kind of experiments it conducted, but it's more so preprint uh, broad announcements. So, so I think that's sometimes where you have to be cautious to a certain degree as well, that you need to, I think our integral um, science you know, rigorous procedure is important to get to be able to be able to say stuff with confidence. Mm -hmm. However, it is good to know that um, we are moving towards that track. And there is research happening constantly to broaden our uh, knowledge in this field. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we have, uh, luckily, a, a government that is very, you know, rigorous in terms of its, its treatment of, you know, data and the statistics around that data. So we're very fortunate to have that sort of leadership, but we do need to sift through the noise sometimes and sort of, you know, eliminate the things that just don't make any sense. Um, Vali, you know, that I want to build on Nikita's answer and sort of punt that in your direction. You know, we saw all the different types of masks that are used and the recommendations on social distancing. Um, you know, on the one hand, in the beginning of this pandemic, we were initially told, at least in Canada, that, you know, masks were not needed. Social distancing was really not a thing. And, you know, we could we could go about our daily lives as long as we washed our hands all the time. And that was the, like in the very early stages of it. Then we decided that, you know, we needed to wear masks. And then very soon after that, we decided that it was social distancing that was needed and it had to be six feet apart. And then there was some news that came out later then that said that it needed to be 20 feet apart, depending on what you were doing. Like if you were running behind somebody else and they were, you know, very close to you, that you could, you could even spread the virus across 20 feet. And that was another example of how we didn't, things are constantly changing. So what is the current best recommendation for wearing a mask and social distancing that you would give to our attendees today? Uh, social distancing is a must. Right from the beginning, India has been following that six meter uh, distance must be maintained because uh, air droplets also may pass the uh, virus infection, right? So I recommend, I, I always recommend right from the beginning, social distancing is a must and use of a respirator N95 mask would be better because it has a uh, triple layer uh, mask protection as well as uh, it has some uh, air lockets where you can even uh, breathe in and breathe out at that, at that uh, space given to it. So I prefer social distancing as well as N95 mask can be worn by the people. And that, that's an interesting recommendation because, you know, many of us don't have access to an N95 mask, right? That's a, a very, very difficult mask to obtain, especially since their priority is for medical workers to use them. Um, what can we do if we don't have access to an N95 mask to protect ourselves? To maintain social distancing and better be at stay, be stay, and stay at home. Because uh, we cannot, uh, if any necessity needed, maybe you can go out, but whereas if it is not, we have, if you're not going to use any mask like these, um, if, it is, if it is not available, uh, then we have to take precautions staying at home. I think that's very good advice. And I, I would, you know, I know that it's difficult, especially, you know, when, when you have people that depend on you, you, know, you may be giving a caregiver to an essential, an essential caregiver to someone in your family, an elder member of your family, but obviously we, we recommend highly that you do that. Um, so thank you, Vali. Um, building on that, I want to jump over to Grant and, you know, sort of demystify the whole nutrition um, around questions around nutrition, basically. You know, there have been some uh, lots of questions around, you know, do we need to disinfect packaging of, of the things that we bring into our house? You know, we we all go buy groceries and we, we those groceries often come in packages that are you know, composed of cardboard matrices and plastics and, and the things that were listed as being able to harbor the virus for multiple days or hours. Um, and yet in your presentation, in your portion of this one paper, you know, you said that there was no evidence to suggest that any sort of uh, foodborne transmission had occurred. Um, is this really the case? And is it just because of a lack of controlled, um, you know, research to, to verify whether that's actually possible or are we truly okay not worrying about this? What, what is your recommendation in terms of how we deal with packaging? Thanks, Rohan. <clears throat> um, the answer is yes and no. Um, <laughs> like a perfect scientist, I'll say it's yes and no. Uh, we know that the virus needs uh, living biological material to survive. CDC has, has said that. 
And um, so far, the CDC and WHO have said that there is no evidence that the coronavirus transmission can occur from food or the packaging. However, we do know, as, as was stated in this presentation, that it can exist from 24 to 72 hours on a variety of surfaces. So the possibility is there. Um, so it does not, I think, it does not uh, negate that certainly people in the food processing industry need to have, uh, need to follow proper uh, food uh, hygiene and proper uh, protection measures like PPEs that Valley was talking about. Um, it's, a, it's significant that a survey recently done by Finger and colleagues in 2021, so it's a brand new study, they were looking at uh, food processing uh, staff and 3,000 of them uh, were surveyed and they found that 6% uh, did not use face masks when they should, uh, that about 11% did, did not have proper hand washing techniques and about 28% uh, use incorrect uh, products for uh, disinfectant. So I think we, so that, that's why it's a yes and no. We still have to be very aware of the potential for transmission that way. Um, but at the same, same uh, time, uh, we, do, we do recognize that there hasn't been no, no evidence of that transmission. I wanna add something too to what Valley had said. We did a study here looking at, um, uh, recycling of face masks. And I think people have to realize that when they do have access to face masks, you cannot use a face mask like a surgical mask over and over and over and over again and expect it to provide you with the protection that you got the first time. So you do have to recycle uh, or, or use new masks uh, on a regular basis. Uh, they don't work continually all the time. And I, th I think that's the, that's the case for the cloth masks as well. Uh, washing the cloth masks and making sure that you're, you're putting in as, as best you can fresh masks is a good way to reduce the infection and spread of uh, infection. Yeah, that's, that's very good uh, advice, Grant. And uh, I, I don't know if we all diligently, you know, practice those those principles of you know making sure we dispose of those blue masks when we've used them once or twice but i think that's something we should definitely start doing if we're not already um so i'll come back to you in a second grant um okay, uh, I, uh, if i may add i mean like to as a, I mean, as a company that we are manufacturing reusable fabric masks and we put a medical grade uh, filters on these things and uh, have done some studies with McMaster University Center for PPE uh, in terms of reusability of these masks. Because one of the major concern is that uh, all of us are taking an approach of uh, just just taking uh, I mean like whatever is the best approach that that can uh, that can stave off I mean uh, this infection spread. But uh, it's not practicable. I mean like it's not practicable to use N95 mask in all circumstances or I mean like use disposable blue masks at all circumstances, because I mean like, there is already evidence that uh, Canada is producing, I mean like tons of this disposable waste uh, every day. I mean like, and uh, they are now discovering this blue mask, I mean like deep in the ocean bed, okay? uh, within, within about three months of the pandemic start. Uh, so this is not a sustainable solution and fabric masks, I mean like in, uh, Almost, I mean, like the studies are showing that I mean, like more than ninety percent of the time, fabric mask that is everyday washed and reused can be as good for general public. I mean, like as any other type of mask, and there is no need for jumping into I mean, like a higher grade one. I mean, like if if there is a if if at all. Okay, yeah. A very very good point, and you know we don't want to create more waste if we don't have to. So obviously, um, the preference is to not use. Uh, single-use masks if you are, you know, a member of the general public. Obviously, if you're a medical professional or you're working in a healthcare setting, that does change. You need to replace your mask in those situations due to contamination risk. And, and you know, so that is a, not an option for them. But for most of us, 90% of us don't need disposable masks very likely and, and can get away with using a cloth yeah. mask if we're diligent about, you know, washing them, as Grant pointed out. 
Um, so a very good re reminder as well. Thank you very much, Venkat. Um, we actually have a question from an attendee. Uh, so Dr. D. Krishnamurti would like to ask Dr. Venkat a question. Um, the question is, has Canada started using UVC to disinfect COVID-19 virus? Uh, the, I mean, like, just like Grant, I mean, like as a true scientist, I would say yes and no. Uh, the yes is that uh, we are, I mean, like uh, in select places, I mean, like uh, if any of you had listened to, uh, listened to uh, the presentation from, uh, from NRC, this morning, I mean, like she was mentioning that uh, uh, a company in Canada is making UVC disinfection uh, device for uh, disinfecting and reusing N95 masks. Because I mean, like in the early stages of uh, pandemic, there was a, there was an acute shortage of uh, the medical grade masks, and uh, people were finding I mean, like various different ways of reusing it. One was I mean, like chemically fumigating that. Other one is rising that to a higher temperature to to deactivate the viruses. And the third uh, possibility, I mean, like by and large, I mean, like the most adopted method uh, is using, I mean, UVC disinfection method. Uh, and this is also, I mean, like an, up, an approved method by uh, US uh, Federal Drug Agency. Uh, so there is, there are, I mean, like a few places, I mean, like I would say, I mean, like very limited places uh, where people are reusing a 95 mask after UVC disinfection. But what is more effective in terms of UVC disinfection is upper room ventilation and in room ventilation. Because I mean, like many of us uh, have been, I mean, like uh, talking about disinfecting the surfaces using chemical disinfectants. Uh, for example, I mean, like every time when we go to a supermarket, we see the shopping carts are being, I mean, like by clean with uh, chemical disinfectants. We do that, but uh, we seldom have, I mean, like anything to address the, the contamination of air around us. Okay, that's basically because I mean, like, we don't have too many tools available for us to do that. Uh, uh, if you are going to a hospital waiting room and you are waiting there, you are inhaling uh, the air of people. I mean, like who have come there uh, with some sort of infection, and uh, there is no way to clean those things. Under those circumstances, uh, one of the most effective method of using uh, like disinfecting the air is actually putting UVC in upper room ventilation. Okay. Uh, basically, in the, in the air ducts, I mean, like that uh, buildings have, you can have banks of UVC, very high power. You can have as high power as possible because I mean, like it's not under any kind of I mean, like uh, any any anywhere in the vicinity of human human presence. So they can I mean. Uh, kill uh, all the viruses, the airborne viruses, uh, very effectively. Uh, and this method, I mean, like surprisingly, I mean, like it predates the use of antibiotics uh, in controlling infections. I mean, the Russians have been continuously using this for more than 60, 70 years. Uh, we started uh, dropping using AV in upper room ventilation since the advent of uh, cheaper antibiotics. But now we are discovering that, I mean, like antibiotic resistance is pushing us back to these kind of methods. So, I mean, uh, to, to answer the question more effectively, more, more clearly, that there are, I mean, like selected UVC disinfection uses, use cases in, uh, in Canada, but uh, where it is most effective, we are not using it. Yeah, thanks for answering the question, Dr. Venkat. Let's now go back to, uh, again, I wanna encourage everybody to use that chat box. That was a great question. Um, we have you know, many attendees here who are, are obviously uh, very uh, well informed on this and, and please submit your questions so we can have them answered by this expert panel. Um, I'm gonna jump back to um, one of my own questions that I have on, on this topic. Uh, Dr. Venkat, maybe you can answer this as well. Um, you know, we were talking a little bit about the accuracy and the rigor of data around uh, these different technologies. and one of the things that has come to light, um, which I think you mentioned in a conversation that we had some weeks ago, was that there are some UV technologies that are available, um, you know, kind of over the counter, so to speak, you know, on Amazon, you know, these handheld wands that you can, you know, use um, that claim to do the same things that, you know, these the proper units, medical units can do. Um, you know, firstly, do they work? Are they, are they legitimate? Should we be careful about purchasing such things? Um, versus something from a more established um, company or provider, and and I guess the other question is, uh, are there are there other areas that we should be worried about? You know, Me Too products, whether it's masks, whether it's you know drugs, whether what other things like this that are you know perhaps um, not legitimate, should we be worried about both in the medical device sector as well as other sectors? But then when it comes to COVID nineteen. 
Yeah, so I mean, like it's a it's a very important question. I mean, uh, because uh, if you go to Amazon, I mean, I can just do a random search for UVC uh, or UV disinfection devices. Uh, you see, I mean, like uh, a lot of them. I mean, like thousands of them coming in there in Amazon and eBay. Uh, so a lot of them are calling them as I mean, uh, handheld UVC sterilization device. Because uh, first of all, I mean, like there is I mean, like a critical difference between disinfection and sterilization. Sterilization is a term that is used at the medical level of I mean, uh, removing of pathogens. In most of the cases that we talk about here, I mean, like we use the term I mean, like disinfection. Um, with that little bit of clarification, uh, if you see something that is true, true good to be true probably they are not true. I mean, like that's my rule of thumb over here. Just don't buy anything, I mean, like from online retailers, uh, I mean, period, okay. Because I mean, like there are, I mean, uh, claims that are made that uh, a tiny device, I mean, like almost as small as your pen, uh, people say that, I mean, like you can, uh, it's battery operated, you can get close to this thing that you are, you want to disinfect. For example, I mean, like if you are picking up a keychain from somebody before that, I mean, like you use this band, or if you are going to be using any kind of thing, I mean, like just roll this band on the top of it uh, and magically, I mean, like we will make you perfectly safe. Uh, these claims are false, bogus, and have been, I mean, like uh, severely reprimanded by various health agencies, including, I mean, like Health Canada and FDA, FDA I mean, like I say, no. Basically, because uh, there are a few reasons for this. In order for, I mean, like a UV device to be working very effectively, there are certain parameters that are very critical. First and foremost is the wavelength. Uh, it has to be in the germicidal wavelength region, I mean, like, which is 200 to 280 nanometers. 99% of all the devices that you can buy from uh, these online retailers really fall outside that. I mean, like they are, they have blue, they have, I mean, uh, purple, they have, I mean, uh, UVA in them. Some, some of them have UVB in them. UVB, by the way, I mean, like it's very harmful and carcinogenic. I mean, like one has to avoid that. Uh, so if you don't have that appropriate wavelength, definitely it's not going to be, I mean, like killing any of those pathogens. The second thing is that uh, the, the efficacy of these things is going to be depending upon uh, what we call as the dose, uh, which is a product of the radiant fluence, uh, the, the power of the UV device, uh, and the time for which you are operating that. Uh, it's a product of radiant fluence first, uh, multiplied by the multiplied by the time of operation. And definitely, I mean, like if you're just, I mean, like magically, I mean, like just throwing the band like this, I mean, like nothing is going to disappear in these cases. Uh, so, I mean, like I would uh, strongly recommend uh, just to save your dollars, save your rupees, I mean, like don't go anywhere near them. Okay. Uh, and to come back to the second thing, I mean, like, and an extended uh, approach, I mean, like, uh, to the whole thing, uh, making bogus claims on the other thing uh, that I have come across is uh, is on the mask. Okay, uh, there are people advertising, I mean, like, fabric-based antimicrobial mask. Okay, uh, to my, to the best of my knowledge, uh, there aren't any. And uh, when people are trying to make something uh, in that case, they have been retracted. For example, I mean, like, uh, there was a company that was manufacturing graphene based uh, face mask, I mean like graphene laced face mask and graphene was supposed to be act as a physical filter, filtering out the viruses in that. Uh, but what has happened is that, and this was, I mean like bulk procured by the Quebec uh, government and was given to some uh, childcare places and things like that. Uh, and very quickly it was uh, pulled back because graphene can get into your lungs, okay. And, uh, and in the long run, I mean, like it's carcinogenic, okay? So you don't want to, I mean, like to jump from, um, I mean, one, one problem to the another problem or a problem that can come back and hit you at the long run. So there aren't, I mean, like many, any kind of cheap antimicrobial uh, fabric mask or anything like that. There are, I mean, like a lot of research being done, including, I mean, like I, I do have a program with the University of Toronto on studying some photocatalyst uh, based nanomaterials for these applications, but uh, we wouldn't go anywhere near that because these require, I mean, like long clinical trials before we start recommending to people. Thank you, Venka. That's a very, very comprehensive answer. And, you know, I think it's important to know what is, what is legitimate and what is not. And uh, sometimes um, it's very hard to tell the difference because of the claims that are made. Um, I want to move on to a, a question from one of our attendees. So Preet Patel has a question uh, for, I think, for Grant and me as well. Um, 
the question is, is there any evidence of mesenchymal stem cells or nutrition impacting other infectious diseases? Uh, Grant, you want to start and then I'll kind of feed off of your answer a little bit. Okay, so, so I'll take the question as, is there any evidence that nutrition can influence other diseases? And the answer is, um, you know, we've looked at nutrition in a variety of different uh, pandemics in the past. Uh, the 1918 flu, uh, influenza uh, virus, uh, um, a variety of different ones, um, including Ebola. Uh, um, and what we found is that uh, each one of them uh, have major effects on nutritional behavior, uh, but also accessibility uh, and food security. Uh, mostly what happens, uh, particularly in third world countries, is a lack of access to food, either due to uh, you don't have the quality or quantity of food uh, available to you for a variety of different reasons, or um, you simply are losing jobs, which is happening across the world as well, and you no longer have the economic ability to uh, to to uh, uh, access the food that you need to. Uh, so there's certainly evidence that uh, every one of these pandemics have an effect on nutrition. Can nutrition have an effect on any one of these pandemics? And the answer is very uh, scant on that. Um, there's certainly lots of evidence that's mostly laboratory evidence that if you increase the immune system, you're going to increase your resistance to a particular infectious disease. But the reality is in the real world, uh, there's not very much evidence that, for example, taking vitamin supplements or nutraceuticals will have a major impact on mortality, morbidity of the, of the, uh, of the infection, whatever that infection is. It makes sense, um, you know, a virus is a pretty strong infectious uh, agent and it's pretty hard to expect that nutrition would have an impact on, on its transmission. Certainly if your immune system is compromised, you're gonna be uh, more susceptible to uh, morbidity problems and severity of the symptoms. That's very clear, for example, in the elderly in North America and in Europe, several studies have shown that there is a correlation between malnutrition, uh, particularly in the elderly and severity of COVID-19 symptoms. So that's certainly uh, evidence that nutrition has an impact, but I think they're in very select populations, not, not unimportant, uh, to recognize and to address, but in the general population that's healthy, uh, eating a proper diet, does that stop the infection? The answer is probably no. Thanks, thanks, Grant. Yeah, and, and I guess I'll build on your answer without you know, trying to repeat uh, too much, but with mesenchymal stem cells, you know, they're um, a very uh, hot area of research right now. Um, they've been researched you know, since the days of bone marrow transplantation in the 50s and 60s. So there's a lot of body of evidence around their safety and their, their efficacy in certain indications. What has also now come to light is that whereas previously mesenchymal stem cells were known to uh, differentiate into all cell types of mesodermal lineage, whether it's bone, fat, muscle, cartilage, or adipose, or, or, heart, or, or any other tissue of that lineage, they're also known to be immunomodulatory. And that's actually what makes them so effective in the treatment of acute respiratory distress, um, which is what's prevalent in COVID-19. As to whether they would be useful in treating other infectious diseases, um, mesenchymal stem cells have actually been shown to be uh, immunomodulatory, but also to bolster um, bacterial uh, uh, resistance to bacterial infections. So for example, they drive macrophages from a naive phenotype to uh, more of a, a uh, immunomodulatory phenotype, uh, which means that they can actually either suppress uh, the rampant response to a bacterial infection or a viral infection. 
Um, they have been used, for example, in sepsis, which is an infection. Um, they've been used, as I said, in ARDS, in acute respiratory distress. And if you think about how some diseases progress, there are certain populations of, of the world that have a higher incidence of cardiovascular disease or higher incidence of diabetes. While these are not infectious diseases, their spread can be almost likened to that of an infectious disease because they're isolated to certain communities or present in more some communities more than others, and then they start to they start to move over as those communities intermingle. And in some of those cases, like cardiovascular disease, uh, you know, um, other other diseases that are similar to those that are that are spread in that way. Um, MSCs have been used in almost every indication you can imagine. So it is an interesting to see, thing to see how this will evolve. Of course, we need to do proper uh, randomized, you know, placebo-controlled uh, clinical trials to really study their efficacy, but now that activity has picked up quite a bit. Um, and for the interest of time, I know we have five minutes left in this session. Um, I just want to make sure that um, we're going to be going, to, everybody understands that we're going to be going back to the summit after this. Um, so in the chat box, there is a link um, and you can uh, go back to the summit after that. But let's just have a quick uh, review of, you know, sort of takeaways from the session. This is a Canada-India healthcare summit and we want to try and synergize our efforts and our various areas of expertise to bring uh, better health to both of these countries. So very quickly in 30 seconds, Nikita, um, and rest of the team here, what are your thoughts on how we can better synergize between Canada and India to, to bring these two countries together to, to address this pandemic? I think from the vaccine point of view, we can see that India has done a fantastic job of mass production within India. And that is something that definitely Canada can learn from. Vice versa, Canada does have a lot of novel um, technology that is developing that we can collaborate with India as well. So I think moving forward, collaboration to understand how we can use our technology to advance mass production is necessary between both countries. Yeah, fully agree. Um, Bali, your thoughts there? Yeah, connecting these two countries uh, actually uh, they, this plays a very vital vital role in the future of vaccination because uh, producing a vaccination like uh, finding out a vaccine for a disease, especially in this short period, is really really hard. So I wish these two countries join together for further collaborations and bring out the best in vaccine production. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, Grant, your thoughts there in terms of nutrition and how we can do better there? Very quickly, um, certainly uh, nutrition and malnutrition is a problem in certain, as in certain areas, certain populations in India, and Canada is a breadbasket. So uh, helping uh, with uh, food availability uh, to India from Canada would be uh, obviously uh, helpful in uh, reducing malnutrition and, and uh, reducing then the COVID uh, morbidity. Yeah, I think we can definitely do much more than we are there. And obviously there are efforts in place uh, to send supplies and essentials over there already. Um, Dr. Venkat, how can we help to address the pandemic in India based on your expertise? Yeah, I'm, uh, I always tend to see the big picture and the silver lining that can come out of I mean, like any dark uh, dark situations. Uh, we have undergone I mean, like severe uh, downtime I mean, like in the last one year, but then we have also learned a lot of positives. One of the things that, uh, that amazes me is that I mean, like the seasonal flu has completely disappeared from Canada I mean, like, and, and many other countries as well. I mean, like, that's basically because I mean, like, people are practicing general hygiene People are using masks. I mean, like people are cleaning mm -hmm. the, uh, things. I mean, like more often and things like that. Uh, so I'm tending to see. I mean, like what are the I mean, like followed benefits uh, beyond COVID-19? I mean, like for the general healthcare. I mean, uh, in this case, I mean, like if you look into the masks are here to stay. I mean, like even when COVID-19 completely disappears. I mean, like we get everybody vaccinated and it completely disappears. We are still going to continue to use. I mean, like mask in some form. I mean, like in selected places. Uh, for I mean uh, for controlling the spread of any kind of contagious disease, uh, and uh, that, uh, similarly on the same token, I mean like on my topic of uh, UV disinfection devices, uh, they provide you I mean like broad spectral uh, antimicrobial uh, disinfection tool. Okay, basically they can uh, they they're not restricted to COVID nineteen by any by any case. Uh, they kill all kinds of viruses, uh, bacteria, and uh, 
fungi mold everything i mean like so they they can be i mean like a broader tool i mean like in combating with all these things so, so what what would be really nice to have is is a kind of a long term sustainable collaborative program in exploring i mean like what emerges out of these things beyond covid 19 to generally strengthen the healthcare in both the countries and how innovation from one country i mean like can migrate as a commercial product i mean like for example i mean like the market here in canada is very limited but as market in india is much bigger i mean like uh, as somebody who is a, who is developing a product uh, i always look at that i mean like where is it going to be more useful okay so i mean uh, and and i hope that i mean like policy makers facilitate those things yeah absolutely i, I think there's a lot more that can be done and obviously there's a lot that's already happening and just for my own uh, area i would say that india is actually uh, known as a biotech hub especially certain parts of india they uh, manufacture you know something like more than 50% of the world's vaccines um and you know it's it's important to recognize that we can work more closely with them to manufacture cell therapies as well cell and gene therapies in fact india is actually already a pioneer in the manufacturing of cell and gene therapies um many companies stemputics i, I can name them all um are working with mesenchymal stem cells and already realize their benefits are conducting clinical trials in that area. So I agree that we can do much more to synergize with India on this. And I hope that this forum has been a chance to demonstrate that synergy. Um, the members of this panel reflect that. And I'd like to thank everybody here, um, Ms. Nikita Tucker, Ms. Vali Natarajan, Dr. Venkat Venkataramanan, Dr. Grant Pierce, and all of our attendees really, really want to thank you all. Um, for your contributions to this white paper and to the session. Um, I'd like to remind everybody, we're just gonna put up a link here to direct you back to the session. Um, you know, Please go back to the main session after this so that we can wrap up for day one. And again, thanks to everybody for all of your attendance and your, your interest and participation. Thank you very much.